guests and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, great to see all the, the questions coming in the Q&A function. We're going to have to uh, try and speed through all of them. And I think maybe if we don't, Dave, Henry and Nick, I'll put it to you to try and answer those and uh, hopefully you can share it with the delegates afterwards if we don't get to all of them. Now, uh, I think uh, someone who's certainly smiling at the moment is Tim Cook. He's got almost two trillion reasons to smile as Apple's uh, market cap approaches Two trillion, I think it was nine, one point nine seven trillion that it closed at last night. And I think what I was certainly wondering was, aren't we still in a pandemic that's forced Apple to shut down its retail stores around the world and withhold its usual financial forecast? Wasn't Tim Cook just in the hot seat in front of Congress defending Apple's business practices? And it speaks to the the regulatory spotlight on tech companies. And uh, doesn't practically everyone who needs a smartphone already have one anyway? And I think uh, you're not alone if you're wondering some of those questions just about Apple. But I think, as we've just heard from uh, Henry, Nick and Dave, uh, inexorably what we are seeing through this crisis is that technology bears a far greater influence on our daily lives and our investment portfolios than it ever has. And I think what happens next in the story of technology and this technological revolution that we're going through um, is the big question. How can investors navigate these things, these regulatory potential headwinds, uh, the impacts that COVID is having, and uh, who will the new winners be, or will it just be the entrenched uh, sort of fangs winner takes most, as Dave has said. Uh, with that, with so many questions, uh, I think uh, I'm going to open up to the panel. Nick, you are very humble, uh, not mentioning that your fund is the top performing tech fund this year so far, up 42%. So I had to get it in there. But uh, let's start with the regulatory question because it's a, there's a common theme coming through the Q&A and that is all around regulation. And I think for so long, the Chicago sort of school of thinking held that as long as consumer prices were falling, there really wasn't a competition issue. But I think when transactions are done in data rather than dollars, to Dave's point, and we know that um, when we use something for free, um, we're effectively uh, paying with our own data here. It's an opaque system. There is a, a real concern, I think, amongst the uh, investors that the regulators are going to try and break the big tech monopoly up. Uh, how real is that threat? Is it possible? And to your point about there is no alternative, is it possible to break big tech up or will it just be a handbrake on growth into the future? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, as Dave said, it's quite a complex Subject. I think if we if we look at the if we, let's start with the U.S. Like so, the U.S. framework for for antitrust is kind of two questions: is it a monopoly, and then two: is there consumer harm? Um, I think in the case of of Google, you can say there's a there's a monopoly because they are do completely dominate search. I think in the case of Amazon, it's very difficult to say that there's a monopoly. If, I mean, it also, it depends on how you define the market. So if you say their market is retail, then there's still a, then there's still a small, small percentage of overall retail. Even they're not even, they don't even have a monopoly in online retail. So depending on the way those discussions go, they could say, well, we're not a monopoly, end of discussion. Um, and, and the problem is if you look at the, the, the qu kind of questions that Congress asks, they go in there with a presumption that there's a monopoly. So that there's, they don't even look at the facts. Um, so I think with very little understanding around these issues, it, it gets messy out of the gate. So, so that's the first thing. Is there a monopoly? Even Facebook, you know, what, well, what is social media? Um, is, is if we talk an email or another or SMS, is that, is that, is that social? Well, maybe that, they would make that argument. So it's difficult to say, that they have a monopoly. It's difficult to say that Amazon's got a monopoly. Um, Google is a different story. And then when it comes down to the app stores, that gets quite complex too. So, so the first problem is, is there a monopoly? So that's a difficult one too. In, 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 most, in most of these cases, there is no monopoly. So the second thing is, is there, even if there is a monopoly, is there consumer harm? Um, most of these, I mean, a lot of these services are free. Um, and actually, yeah, I think with the exception of, well, I mean, people won't vote with their feet. So people, if you fill out a survey, you'll say, no, I never use Facebook. It's terrible or whatever. That's, that's, your, that's what you tell people. But then, you know, a minute later, people are on their phone and they're on Facebook. And I know for myself, I, um, when the thing comes, I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm looking up something, 
on the internet and it says accept cookies, I just say yes. <laughs> I know that they're tracking me all over the web, but I, I do it out of convenience. I think, um, so, so generally what these companies have done, they give you access to free services, or it's more convenient, um, they provide a, provide a lot of value. So I think it's difficult to argue the consumer harm angle. All of that said, um, you know, the tall poppy syndrome is, is true in life. Like people just get jealous when, when someone is very big and very successful and they want to take them down. Um, and, and I think you, you might see, and I think you will see politicians continue going after them just because they're a quote unquote easy target and they're rich and we need tax money. And so let's go after them. They will invent a way to go after them eventually. Um, these companies are not unpopular with, with, uh, with consumers. So that's kind of, I think there's a narrative almost created by the, by the press and the, the politicians that I'm not as sure is commensurate with how consumers feel about these companies. So I think Bezos in his re recent testimony before Congress said, look, we're the second most trusted institution after the US military in America. So they're certainly not hated. Um, another thing is like a lot of small businesses benefit on the, uh, on the, on the platforms that these companies provide. So, there's 9 million small businesses advertising on Facebook. There's 180 million, I think is the figure, companies operating on Facebook. You, you cut out their ability to target ads. That's very, very damaging to small businesses. Um, millions of small businesses use Amazon as a, as a platform to reach customers. So um, you've got to be, one has to be careful about this. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's always in the discussion. The, the regulatory angle. And so to that extent, I think it must at least be partially priced in. I, I've, I've felt for the last five plus years that these stocks are actually cheap, um, despite people saying high multiples, all of that kind of thing. Um, the, I wouldn't say they're screamingly cheap today, but I still think there's value. And I think part of that is that this sort of regulatory fear um, is embedded to some extent, some probability of it. And so I think if there was to be a legal process, I think given also how much, how much lobbying power these guys have and how much effort they would go into to sort of fighting any uh, sort of court action, I think it would drag out for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Can you break them up? I think, you know, if you break up uh, Facebook from Instagram, you split it out, you break out WhatsApp, does that materially hurt Facebook? I don't, I, like, I, I'm, not I'm not sure that it does. Um, what it might do is actually crystallize some, some value, like as investors, and we can see what those different parts are worth and we can assign maybe a higher multiple to the faster growing part of the business. Um, so I don't, think this is a, I don't think this is a scenario that we're going to see at least within the next, I would say, three to five years. Um, but look, the other thing to do is I say to people, you know, by all means, you can hold these, but there's a world of other, other tech stocks that you can invest in. So in the Anchor Global Equity Fund, we've done really well this year out of Etsy, which is like, a, is like an Amazon, but for craft kind of small handmade items. So it's like an anti-Amazon mm -hmm. to, to an extent. C in Southeast Asia, so Etsy and C are both up like 200% this year. C is e-commerce and gaming in Southeast Asia. And Mercado Libre, which is the Amazon of Latin America, up 100% this year. So um, a lot of focus on big tech, still positive on those business models, but there's a whole world out there of, of other names that you can look at too. So I'm hogging the conversation, but I'll leave it there. No problem. Let's, let, let's, let's move it. And I think in a similar vein, David, there's this issue now that's emerged that perhaps is more important for investors now, and that's the, the fight between US and China. And you mentioned TikTok earlier. I think each side sort of has its warriors, uh, whether the tech companies in Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook on the US side, or you've got Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba in China, or the chip makers, you've got Qualcomm versus Huawei. How do you see this playing out? How do you see this decoupling of the US and Chinese um, uh, tech stories, so to speak, impacting the way investors might want to be accessing these opportunities? So uh, there's certainly a rise of nationalism ac across the world. Um, and I think it means that tech companies are going to battle to grow internationally. Um, 
you know, whereas in the past it was much easier to step, if you were a Chinese company, to grow in the U.S. or a U.S. company. Always been difficult to grow in China, to be to be perfectly frank. Um, but certainly for Chinese companies to grow in the U.S. I mean, I think we've had an escalation of tension between India and China as well. And so, um, you know, there was that border uh, skirmish where several Indian soldiers died. And the view on, on in, within India now has changed quite dramatically. Um, and a lot of the apps, TikTok, for example, has also been banned in India. So I think that, you know, typically w- what was lovely about the World Wide Web was that it was open to everyone. And now we're having, having the splintering of the web. And I think that companies are just going to battle to grow outside of their own territory. So, I mean, even even the cloud companies, if you think of Alibaba, Alibaba has become so dominant in China. And one of their big uh, growth drivers going forward was expanding outside of China. And I think that just becomes a lot more difficult now. The cloud business, they're trying to grow it in Southeast Asia. And they're going to be competing with Microsoft and Amazon. Um, so I think uh, it's going to be difficult for both. I mean, tech typically is concentrated in the West Coast of the U.S. and in China. Europe, there isn't much tech uh, in, in, other than SAP and, and you would argue process, which is listed there. But I just think it's going to become more difficult to expand into new territories. And And fortunately, I think for some of the U.S. companies in India, which is probably one of the fastest growing markets now, the market is probably shutting down somewhat for China and the U.S. firms are, are going to have a big push in, into India. I want I to shift because we're running out of time. Yeah, carry on. I just want to shift because we're running out of time and get through another uh, topic that's very t- important, I think, to investors at the moment, uh, purely because Tesla has just gone parabolic this year. And Henry, um, uh, a question here from Edwin Tehran, uh, who says, we've spoken a lot about Facebook and Google, but what's your take on Tesla? Everyone's got a view on Tesla. It's gone parabolic this year. It's, uh, it's overtaken Toyota. It overtook the top three in Detroit, I think, three years ago in terms of market cap, yet still nowhere near producing the kind of scale and volume that any of those incumbents uh, are. But it, it's a tech business, isn't it? It's a, it's a software. It's a, it's a business of the future. It's splitting its stock now uh, as well, which uh, presents um, an interesting uh, potential opportunity, I guess. What, what is your view on Tesla? Is it worth buying? Yeah, I don't think we should get too excited about the stock split. I mean, that's really just the technicality that makes the share easier to buy in smaller portfolios. It doesn't mean anything beyond that, really. Um, But every investor has their one share that they got badly wrong, right? Tesla's one of mine. Um, In fact, it might be the one I got wrong. Uh, But at this point in time, you really need to start making fancy assumptions around um, eventual market share and eventual profit margins to justify the current share price. My colleague, Salejo, that I work with on the tech fund, actually models the company every now and then. And I said to him, you know, Salejo, let's play with the assumptions and see what we need to do um, to justify the current share price. And, um, you know, assuming an output north of 2 million cars a year and a profit margin of 30%, you know, we're battling to, ju- to justify a share price of $1,000. So with the share currently trading at around one and a half, um, I just feel that it, it really looks expensive. But having said that, um, you know, technical factors can drive stock prices as well. This business seems to have an almost cult-like following um, so it's not to say that the share price can't continue to go up, but it's just not a share that I'm, I'm comfortable owning um, at these levels. Uh, I don't know if anyone else on the panel has got a view on Tesla. Dave, Nick? Well, Nick? I mean, we'll hand over to Dave. <laughs> okay, I just saw you unmuting yourselves. So I thought you were going to hold forth. Dave, I'll what's your view on Tesla? I'll see what Dave has to say. <laughs> I think, you know, this idea of buying into electric vehicles, um, it's such a, you know, the vehicle market is an absolutely enormous market. And it's, you know, I've been looking for years to find areas to invest, for example, in green energy. Um, And it's quite difficult to find uh, the right company to invest in. But I think when you're wanting to invest in electric cars, Tesla is your automatic company to look at. 
And so it's it's just the go-to investment for you know for disruption in the auto industry, an absolutely massive industry. Um, and it's it's certainly led the way. It's also got potentially platform economics um, with the software in the vehicle. So it's it's but it, it's too early to say. I think the the Germans have finally <coughs> responded to the threat. And their market share, I mean, numbers came out recently for market shares in Germany. And, you know, the Tesla market share did drop quite dramatically. And Volkswagen's market share has picked up. So, I mean, that's really just in, in Europe so far. But it's just been the go-to investment for, for electric vehicles. It was easy to understand. And then people just went right there. There was also a lot of short activity. So it meant that there was a lot of volatility and it's attracted a lot of uh, individual investors for that reason. A lot of the Robin Hood traders, and that's why I mentioned the split, Nick, because isn't that going to make it more accessible to those Robin Hood traders? Uh, so rather get a pre-split because now you're going to get more of the, the Robin Hood traders piling in. What's your view? So look, um, so just to add to what Dave and Henry said, I think there's the, the other angles that where one could justify a very high price for, for, for Tesla is if you say that, you know, if this is a software enabled business and maybe it becomes more like a, 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 a traditional tech business where it is when it take most, unlike the auto business, which is a fragmented market. And so instead of having the leading player with say 10% market share, you know, maybe you can envision a scenario where the leading player has like 60% share and much higher economics and, and they make a lot of money out of, I don't know, software and, and other kind of services. The other thing would be if they make a really big battery business, that could be a sort of renewable energy business. I mean, that could be a huge, huge, huge business. So I, I, think, you, I think you can paint out scenarios where this becomes an enormous, enormous company over time. I think I also looked this wrong last year. I was looking at it at... You know, at the start of the year, um, you know, I did, I did a lot of work and then I just, there was, you, you could make a lot of arguments that, you know, it could work out, but also, you know, there were always people that thought this could, you know, crash and burn. I think what I did recognize and where I should have acted, but I didn't. Um, so my friend, what we look for is, well, what I look for is multi-baggers. So stocks that have the potential to grow their sales and earnings, et cetera, 5X, 10X over the next five to 10 years. And so stocks that have a, like a huge asymmetry. So you've got the, a lot of upside, but, but the downside is, let's say, I don't know, for, for the worst case for any stock is 100%. But let's say for Tesla last year, it was maybe 50%, say. And because if that stock went down, someone was going to buy them out, like a Google or an Apple or someone was going to take them out. On the other hand, you, you could look at it and say, you know, from that point, if things work out, this stock could be a five bagger or a 10 bagger. I mean, it could go 500% or a thousand percent. Like if things work out. And so you have this enormous kind of asymmetry. And so at that point I felt I didn't have an edge, um, but actually that, that mattered far less than actually the, the asymmetry that was there. So I guess that was a lesson for me. And people say cult stock, like it's a, like it's a bad thing. Um, one of my lessons is if you, if like sometimes you will often, these cult stocks can be really, really powerful because your, your sellers, or sorry, your holders are not sellers. And then everyone is on the outside looking in and they want to buy. And that's what, that's what can drive this really yeah. um, powerful performance in the stock. So I also missed it. Where to from here? I'm not sure. Don't worry, how many people saw Kodak uh, becoming the poster child for uh, re-disrupting itself a couple of weeks ago? Uh, if anyone didn't follow that story, it's now manufacturing pharmaceutical ingredients uh, for potential coronavirus vaccines with the backing of the US government, although um, that loan is now on ice, so that's a different story. Henry, last point here for investors looking to access this theme. Uh, to go now in RANDs with the US uh, um, dollar uh, coming off the boil a little bit, but uh, the RAND's still quite weak against the dollar. What's the best access yeah. point or access route to access these themes? So, Mike, I think, first of all, investors often make big mistakes by worrying about short-term currency movements. Um, at the end of the day, asset allocation is far more important than the near-term rate that you take your money out at. Um, as a business, we do believe that the rand at this point is undervalued. Uh, we think that fair value sits in the region of 15 rand to 15 rand 50. Uh, but having said that, you know, when you make an investment into the tech sector, you're doing it for the long term. And in five to 10 years from now, 
um, the rate that you took your money out at is going to matter far less than the fact that you made that allocation. Um, so that would be my view. I think you need to make the allocation stay the course and in 10 years from now, it won't really matter. Well, what does matter to us is that we've still got 511 participants on the call. So we're not going to call it at nine o'clock. If you guys don't mind, can I steal a little bit more of your time this morning? There's just so yeah, much course. interest and so many more questions that we've actually um, left on the table uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, another question here about where the next Amazon, Apple, Microsoft is likely to come from? Is it, is it going to be that we're going to have three guys in a garage again disrupting these tech players? Because what we do tend to find, and I think from, from David's table of, you know, who were the top players and, Ar and Oracle slipping down, that you do see decade shifts driven by big technologies. And I think one of the big technologies we're seeing at the moment are a convergence of technologies. You've got artificial intelligence, you've got the the, the cloud um, computing power that's bringing that into the hands of, uh, or democratizing that in, in the hands of smaller players. Now, uh, David, perhaps you can just touch on where you potentially see the next big tech disruptors coming from. Uh, I think, well, look, one of the big uh, things that's, uh, that's going to be arriving in the next few years is quantum computing. And that's really where we move away from, from this reliance on chip development to increase processing power. So we move into qubits, uh, which is instead of binaries, noughts and ones, uh, with qubits you can have different range between zero and one. Um, and it allows for very complex calculations. Now the thing is, in that field, IBM and uh, Alphabet and Microsoft are probably leaders in that field. That, all of that would be available on the cloud. So I don't think small players would necessarily be able to break into quantum computing. The question is whether IBM can reestablish some dominance in you know, its traditional mainframe area. Um, the other areas like uh, neural networks, where we try and have a, a link between what's going on in the brain and, and IT systems. We're at the very early stages. There's something that uh, Elon Musk has been the backing uh, moves in that area. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is for me are, are fuel cells, the development of fuel cells. That's really more of a green energy, a shift to green energy. Um, there are lots of little players in that field. Um, and it's an, it's an area that I'm trawling at the moment to try and find um, things to invest in. Um, and then Nick referred to it, but I mean so, uh, batteries, but solid state batteries, um, where, uh, you know, that would be, a, I mean, possibly a few years out, but that's another big area. So these would be moonshots um, that are not necessarily software, purely software driven. Um, so at this stage, I think it's difficult with the surveillance of the large firms to break in as a, as a software, as a new software company. Um, but I think we, people are also referring to the post-platform world. Um, but that would be, I suppose, if there's been a big change in regulation where, you know, if the regulators or if governments have felt that these dominant firms have been abusing their dominance, then you could move into a post-platform world where all the data is shared and available to everyone. That would allow a lot more companies to break in uh, at, to the top in, in the software space. So there's just a few Henry? ideas. Absolutely. Henry, I don't know if you've got a, a, a thought on... Uh, you know, where where the next big multi-bag is uh, potentially going to come from? You know, Mike, I, I think the point I want to make um, is that the investment universe out there in the tech space is so broad. You know, we've got a watch list that we trawl through for new investment ideas. And I was, it, it consists of around 120 stocks at this point, but the collective market capitalization, the collective value of those businesses that we're looking at is around $12 trillion. Um, which is, you know, 25 to 30 times the size of the JSE at this point. So um, 
it, the, the innovation and the outperformance isn't just going to come from the facts. There are a lot of smaller businesses out there that could become very big businesses. Um, and it's difficult to list all of them right now. Um, but absolutely, it's not to say that, um, you, you know, there won't be another business that's even bigger than a Facebook or an Amazon or a Google in the next 10 years. So, um, you know, our philosophy is not just to hold the big ones. In fact, 30% of our portfolio um, is exposed to smaller, um, earlier stage technology businesses, which have the potential to outperform the bigger businesses over the longer term, even though it may come with a higher level of, of volatility. Right. Um, we've, uh, I think, come to the end of our time. I see some of the numbers uh, starting to, to drop off. Uh, we, we're down into the 450s. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Matthew. And I'd uh, just like to thank you all again, David Gibb, Nick Dennis, and Henry Bilkin, for a, a really compelling presentation uh, addressing some of the big thematic issues around tech. And uh, it's certainly a massive part uh, of anyone's portfolio and thinking at the moment to be thinking about where all of these themes are going. So thank you so much. Uh, great insights. Uh, and Matthew, I'm going to hand over back to you. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, it was a fantastic discussion. Uh, Henry, Nick and David, thanks a lot for your slides and input. Um, to everyone out there, we will be distributing the slides as well as the recordings a little bit later today. So look out for that. Again, if you don't get hold of them, give us a shout and we'll gladly share them with you. Uh, if you'd like to get any more information on how to access these funds, the Global Technology Fund and Nick Dennis's Global Equity Fund, uh, please get hold of your portfolio manager. Alternatively, reach out to us at invest.anchorcapital.ca.za and, and we'll put you in touch with the right people. Thank you very much for your time today, everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Uh, all the best. Thanks a lot.